Hello, I'm Dr. Deepak Bhatt, Executive Director of Interventional Cardiovascular Programs at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts, where I'm also a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. And I'm really excited to be talking here today with a lot of viewers of the New England Journal of Medicine about the REDUCE IT trial, which I literally just presented five minutes ago as a late-breaking clinical trial at the American Heart Association annual sessions. And I've got to be honest, I'm extremely excited about this trial and discussing it with all of you. I've been involved in a lot of different clinical trials through the years, and honestly, I love them all. The ones that are positive, the ones that are negative, the ones that are somewhere in between, as long as they advance patient care and contribute in some way to science. But this particular trial, of all the trials that I've been involved to to date, I think has the greatest potential to be practice changing and paradigm shifting. And I'm careful in using such terminology that I typically avoid, because here I believe we might be at the dawn of a new scientific era with respect to cardiovascular prevention akin to what happened decades ago with statins as they were first entering clinical trials. Why do I say that? Well, let me recap to you exactly what Reduce It is. And for those of you who want greater detail than I provide, I should mention just today in the New England Journal of Medicine, Reduce It was published simultaneously with my presentation that was given here at the AHA. So the paper, and importantly, the supplement as well, don't forget the supplement, has lots of information. The protocol and statistical analysis plan are posted there as well. So everything is out there in the open for everyone to take a look. Reduce It randomized 8,000 patients who had triglycerides between 135 and 500 milligrams per deciliter and had additional cardiovascular risk to receive either four grams a day of icosapentethyl or placebo. Icosapentethyl is a highly purified EPA or icosapentenoic acid. So four grams a day of that drug versus a placebo in patients with elevated triglycerides and additionally have cardiovascular risk defined as follows. About 70% of the patients had secondary prevention type indications, stable coronary artery disease, stable cerebrovascular disease, stable peripheral artery disease, and the remaining 30% or so had what we called primary prevention type indications, but specifically it was diabetic patients with at least one additional cardiovascular risk factor. So a hybrid population of secondary and higher risk primary prevention. In this population, then, we randomized patients, as I mentioned, to the study drug of placebo, followed them for a median of about five years, and examined cardiovascular events. And by cardiovascular events, I mean a five-point MACE, cardiovascular death, MI stroke, hospitalization for unstable angina, and coronary revascularization. And in that endpoint, there was a 25% relative risk reduction, a 4.8% absolute risk reduction, a number needed to treat of only 21, and that was a highly significant finding. Uh, as you'll see in the New England Journal of Medicine paper, less than 0.001. Though in fact, the actual p-value, New England Journal of Medicine truncates the p-values there, the actual p-value was 0 0.00000001. I might have forgotten a zero. There might have been an additional zero in there. So there's a very statistically significant finding, but in convention, uh, in keeping with their convention, it's a 0.001 in New England Journal. So very robust finding. Now, some doctors might say, well, you know, hospitalization for unstable angina, revascularization procedure, show me the really hard endpoints, quote unquote. That was our pre specified key secondary endpoint, cardiovascular death, MI stroke, and that was reduced by 26%. Again, over a 3% absolute risk reduction, number needed to treat 28. So, uh, clinically robust in a p value there. In the paper, less than 0 0.001, but in uh, actual fact, less than 0 0.00006. Uh, so, once more, very statistically robust findings. Therefore, if we look at subgroups, and there were multiple pre specified subgroups that I presented and are in the paper, in those subgroups, a consistency of benefit pretty much across the board for both the primary and the key secondary endpoint, including key subgroups such as the secondary and primary prevention cohorts where there was a consistency of benefit, males and females, 
U.S., non-U.S., diabetes, no diabetes, triglycerides greater than or less than 200, and also triglycerides greater than or less than 150, as it turned out about 10% of the population enrolled had triglycerides between 135 and 150. So therefore, uh, very robust findings, consistency of benefit across multiple subgroups. Now we did a so-called pre-specified uh, hierarchical statistical analysis, that is, what that means is you can look at one endpoint, if it's positive, you keep going down the list until something's not positive. And if something's not positive in general, you, you know, shouldn't keep going down further. You can, but then it's more exploratory as opposed to definitive. What we found here was all of the secondary endpoints we examined in that statistical hierarchy, things like fatal or non-fatal heart attack, stroke or fatal or non-fatal stroke, that was reduced by 28%, hospitalization for unstable angina, emergent or emergent procedures, all these different things were significantly reduced, including a 20% relative risk reduction in death from cardiovascular causes that was statistically significant. And included in that are significant reductions in sudden cardiac death and also cardiac arrest. Now the final thing on that hierarchy was all-cause mortality. That was not significantly reduced, but there was a trend, a 13% lower rate of all-cause mortality with a p-value of 0.09. And there was no difference in non-cardiovascular mortality, so that difference in all-cause mortality was driven by the significant reduction in cardiovascular mortality. So that, really in a nutshell, is the data that I presented. Now, as far as safety, obviously we also examined that, and in general the drug was as well tolerated as placebo was. The adverse event rates of note were atrial fibrillation, where adjudicated atrial fibrillation was significantly higher by about 1% absolute. But importantly, stroke, the most feared complication of atrial fibrillation, was not higher with icosapentethyl versus placebo. In fact, there was a 28% reduction in that endpoint with the study drug versus placebo. So while physicians should be aware of atrial fibrillation as a possibility, uh, on the other hand, it doesn't seem to be associated with the most feared complication from atrial fibrillation, which is stroke, at least on the trial-wide level. The other adverse event uh, of note uh, was serious adverse events lumped together for major bleeding where there was a significant ex well I shouldn't say a significant there's actually a trend it wasn't significant p-value of 0 0.06 when we lumped it all together and looking at it as GI bleeding as serious CNS bleeding uh, looking at uh, fatal bleeding no significant differences between the two arms so uh, again, something doctors should be aware of if they're using this drug in patients, uh, but in absolute terms, uh, relatively modest increases and, in, strictly speaking, not even statistically significant. So, uh, overall, uh, great tolerability, good safety, and uh, outstanding efficacy, uh, such that the overall benefits, I think, of the drug in this population are quite substantial. Now, there's lots of ongoing analyses, as you might imagine. We have planned a cost-effectiveness analysis with a leading academic, but uh, as you might imagine, with a number needed to treat of 21, this is probably going to be highly cost-effective. We've also got biomarker and genetic analyses, detailed analyses planned, trying to get it. What is the mechanism of benefit here? We saw reductions in triglycerides, about 20%. We saw a reduction in HSCRP, about 22%. But the biggest change was in EPA levels, a 360% increase in EPA levels with study drugs. So we're going to try to tease apart, for the sake of science and future studies, what exactly drove the benefit on multiple endpoints in this trial. I mentioned a bunch of endpoints, but elective revascularization was significantly reduced, a tertiary endpoint, albeit pre-specified, uh, stroke, sudden cardiac death. It seems like a lot of different endpoints that if it were just an anti-inflammatory or just a triglyceride-lowering drug or just a drug with some antithrombotic capabilities, wouldn't really expect necessarily such a large degree of benefit across multiple endpoints. So, you know, I think the findings uh, will be practice changing. You know, some questions that have been asked uh, to me in the uh, minutes after the presentation, what about statins? Well, our goal was to treat patients with statins and Indeed, the LDL coming into the trial on average was 75, so this was a well-treated 
patient population with statins. The average LDL is better than many patients in, in actual practice. Uh, so this is truly an incremental advance over statins. Uh, some have asked about the difference in LDL, five milligram per deciliter difference between the study drug and placebo in one year, and uh, have asked, you know, oh, the placebo is a mineral oil, you know, might that be causing some harm? I've got to say, I think uh, that line of inquiry is flawed, but, but even if somebody is really concerned about that, I would say that five milligrams per deciliter in LDL over five years wouldn't cause a 25% relative risk reduction. Be projected to cause maybe a two, three percent. The most optimistic extrapolations from the cholesterol clinical trial collaboration be maybe four percent. So again, it, it, it wouldn't explain it. And, and people forget there was an older trial, Jealous, a Japanese trial, very well done, that showed a 19 percent relative risk reduction in ischemic events with a lower dose of EPA. Not exactly this drug, but uh, nonetheless uh, somewhat uh, opening the door to the concept of EPA as a cardiovascular protective agent. And that trial was randomized, but it was open label, meaning that there was no actual placebo. Patients either got that study drug or they got nothing on a background of, of low dose statin. So that's uh, there for people that don't like the mineral oil placebo. Well, that was an open label trial with no mineral oil placebo and still a significant 19% relative risk reduction. I'll point out there as well, at the time, many people I was one of those people criticized, jealous, saying, oh, it's open label, it should have been double blind. So, you know, we did a trial in a rigorous way, and if you think about it, what will we use as a placebo? Uh, we could have used a sugar pill, but then obviously the patient would know they're getting a sugar pill, and they'd be unblinded, uh, and so that wouldn't have worked. Uh, we could have used olive oil, but then if the trial was negative, people would have said, oh, what are you guys, stupid? Uh, why did you use olive oil? So, you know, we settled on mineral oil because it had to be something with similar consistency and appearance uh, as icosapentethyl. So that, you know, that was the reason for it. And uh, for folks that aren't uh, satisfied with those degree of answers and, and really think that there's uh, something there, uh, which there isn't, uh, we actually did an analysis. It's published in the uh, results section of the New England Journal of Medicine paper. It's just a line in there, but what it alludes to is an analysis of placebo versus patients, uh, study drug rather, versus placebo in patients who either had an LDL increase at a year or had no LDL increase at a year. And the degree of benefit was really quite similar in those two arms. So it really was the case that mineral oil is this highly toxic substance. It's raising LDL cholesterol. It's hurting patients. Well, then we wouldn't have expected to see a benefit in those patients who didn't have an LDL increase. So I think the trial results are robust, and uh, some have then raised the CRP and said, oh, the CRP is going up in uh, the placebo. That's the reason uh, that there's benefit with the study drug, that it's placebo harming patients. So first of all, we were very transparent uh, with our, the biomarkers that we've analyzed and were able to present at this time, and many more biomarker analyses are planned. And we had pre-specified just looking at CRP, and that was presented. And we also pre-specified looking at log transform CRP, and that's also presented in supplementary table four for those of you that are interested. And what we showed is, first of all, the correct way to look at CRP is really log transform CRP, uh, because that takes out the outliers. And done that way, there is no significant increase in CRP in the placebo arm. Rather, there's a significant decrease in CRP with icosapentethyl, as has been reported previously, such that comparing the two arms, there's a 22% difference in CRP at two years. So I think the study drug is working, it's working robustly. There's not something uh, funny that's going on with the placebo comparator for the reasons that I mentioned. And, and honestly, I don't really think this is such an important point. I raise it because it's one of the questions that has sort of been permeating the Twitter sphere. I, and therefore, I thought, let me use this opportunity to address those sorts of questions head on. You know, it's interesting at the end of the late breaking clinical trial session here, the audience was surveyed to see what they would do in clinical practice based on reduce it. And I don't remember the exact number, I think it was something like 90 plus percent said that they would use icosapentethyl in patients who are similar to the reduce it population. So obviously there's still questions to be answered and we plan to continue analyzing the reduce it database, the clinical the cost effectiveness, uh, the biomarkers, the genetics, and in terms of clinical endpoints, we only presented time to first event, so perhaps if we were to examine total events and recurrent events, 
there are other potential benefits that we haven't yet seen. So there's a lot more work to be done, but I think as far as the top line results go, we've established the safety of icosapent ethyl, given as a cardiovascular reducing drug, and established a very large degree of efficacy. And my hope is that this trial really will open up a whole new era in cardiovascular prevention, maybe harkening back to those early days when statins were first being appreciated, not just as LDL-lowering drugs, but as drugs to reduce cardiovascular events, including death from cardiovascular causes. Well, I hope this perspective has been useful to all of you. And again, if something I said was unclear or I misstated something, the good news is that the paper and the supplement, which is a pretty long supplement, is all in the New England Journal of Medicine at www.negm.org. Thank you so much for your attention.